Hi there, my name is Gronia Humphreys. I'm the director of the Virgin Media Dublin International Film Festival. We're delighted to be working again with Screen Ireland to present a director's masterclass, a fascinating conversation with the Danish director, Suzanne Beer, and hosted by our own board member and acclaimed Irish director, Nasa Hardiman. It's a wonderful, passionate, insightful conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Well, I am delighted to introduce one of the world's foremost directors, famed for potent and compelling morality stories and propulsive thrillers with the most elemental performances that you will ever see on screen. A director who has received multiple awards from the European Film Academy, the first director to win an Academy Award, a Golden Globe and an Emmy, except for some male directors. I am delighted and privileged to introduce the extraordinary Susanna Beer. Susanna, welcome to the Dublin International Film Festival. Thank you. And that was a that was a very like uh, this after this introduction, it can only go downwards. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's such a prevalent a privilege and a pleasure to get to talk to you because of course, uh, you know, I am one of the myriad of massive fans that you have throughout the world. And I'm particularly excited to have this chance to talk to you because this is a masterclass for other directors. So we're going to have lots of directors logging on, trying to learn at the feet of a master like yourself. <laughs> well, thank you. And you. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the question that every director who attends a masterclass always wants to ask, which is, how did you get into the business? Well, <clears throat> I went to film school. Um, I, I mean, that's sort of the most, <laughs> possibly, possibly the most, um, I won't say boring answer, but uh, least surprising answer. Um, so I went to film school. Before that, I started architecture. Um, and I was really, I spent like all my kind of childhood and, and, and youth kind of wanting to do something creative and not quite not quite knowing what it was and I thought okay architecture is a bit of it's a bit of art and it's a bit of something practical and it is but architecture was not for me but it gave me insight to to a sense of structure which has been incredibly helpful ever since um, but it also made me interested in set design and I started reading about set design and then I started reading scripts and then I even applied for film school to be a set designer and I went to an interview and they were like, if you think you might want to be a director, then make up your mind and then apply again and figure out what you want. <laughs> and, and, and then two weeks after, um, they reopened the applications at the Danish Film School and I applied and I got in and I've never looked back. That's brilliant. Now, that, it's really interesting that you started out uh, in a different discipline and that you started out in design and I started out in design. So I have to ask you as well, do you think that that has had an influence in your, uh, in your approach uh, to your directing practice? I think understanding the character of a blueprint which is how an architect works uh, and how, an, how a designer works, but in particular in architect, I wanna say, because, because, it, because a blueprint for architecture is a very, it's a pretty complex blueprint. It's, it's sort of a, a, a mix of, 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 of a lot of practical solutions, but also a lot of aesthetic solutions. And understanding the nature of that, um, has given me a sense of overview that um, I, I think is, is so incredibly valuable. And I, I want to say, you know, if I was to say one thing to, to, to kind of younger directors, is that, that getting a learning and, and practicing a sense of overview is incredibly incredibly helpful that's because really interesting it makes, you, it makes you relax in all the details okay uh, so being able to zoom out yeah it does I, and i don't mean relax in terms of of being sloppy i mean relax in terms of of treat the details it becomes much more joyful dealing with the details okay 
because you, they, so because is it, the, it, spine, can, the spine is sort of solid. I think I understand what you mean. That, in other words, there's there's something in architecture that's transposable to film, which is about a vision and a kind of abstract tone and sensibility that informs everything that goes from there. Yes, but it's more than that. It's actually more. It's actually more detail. Like I want to say, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to direct a feature film. You even, I mean, I stray a lot away from the script when I work. I invent scenes, I change scenes when I'm shooting, I delete stuff, uh, but I know the material in detail and um, uh, before I do that. And I also, for example, I always know the schedule. I kind of, I kind of know, I know, I've kind of, I never have, like I said, I never have a script. I don't really, I always, I, know, I have it all in my mind so that I have, I'm so familiar with it that it's very easy for me to change things without straying away from the core of the story. That's brilliant. So it leaves you enormously flexible having that, uh, having that information in your head. Yes. Let's talk about your first film. Let's talk about uh, Freud is Leaving Home. I can't say it in Danish, unfortunately. It's actually Swedish, so you don't have to say it in Danish. I can't say it in Swedish either. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I was just, um, I was just, uh, uh, yeah. What about it? Um, so, can you tell me about the learning curve? What, 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 it's, it, first of all, tell us a little bit about the story. It, it addresses the Jewish Swedish experience. So, what drew you to that story in particular? I mean, I've got to be honest. I was out of film school, and I had a baby. I mean. I, I had a baby right as I left film school. And uh, there was this Danish director who had been offered this movie and he thought, I don't know how to do this. It's about Jewish family. Um, and he sent it to me. And I was like, I would probably at that point had said yes to directing the phone book. You know, if, <laughs> if, 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 so it was, a, I mean, it was a personal thing because it was a Jewish family and I made it personal once I started. But I think, you know, to be honest, I think I just jumped at the, at the opening, at the kind of, okay, here's a project. You get to do your first feature film. Yes, I'm just going to do it. And, um, and was and, it a steep learning curve from your point of view? It was actually a lot of fun and I thought it was surprisingly easy. And then I got the cruel wake up call with a film that came after uh, uh, because, 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 you know, Fright Leaving Home was, a, was a, quite a big success. And, um, and it had a lot, I mean, it, got, it won awards and it had quite a, quite a significant audience. And then I thought, ah, that's easy. I know how to do this. And then I did a second film and it got smashed. I mean, it got awful reviews. Nobody came to see it. Um, people who kind of went to see it, like at we had test screenings and people were sitting like, um, I'm not sure what it's about. And, and I suddenly, it, I kind of had that wake up call going, okay, it's actually not easy telling stories with moving pictures. It actually takes, thoughtfulness and consideration and and you've got to be incredibly respectful about it that's really interesting so do you think it was one of those horrible moments where we learn more when we make mistakes or when things fail than we learn when they're successful you know we always learn more when we when we uh i mean we always learn more from our mistakes i think that's a i think that's a general thing but you know you also want to be happy and 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 have fun and which is also a valuable thing so i'm not it's not that i recommend making mistakes <laughs> but i do think that <laughs> i do think that um, there's no doubt that if you're capable of overcoming your mistake and if you're capable of forgiving yourself from, from your mistake and and learning from it it does shape you in a or it's a, it, it potentially shapes you in a positive way. I don't think it always does, but I think- Yeah, it can be a very bruising experience, I think, getting, getting poor reviews, it's so public. 
Yes, it is. It's kind of <laughs> sort of humiliating, but but um, but then you realize that that none of it that none of it should really hit your heart. Not the good ones, and not the bad ones. And I and I actually I want to say that. In that respect, the good ones are more dangerous because, because you know, the, the accolades and the success are way more dangerous for, your, for who you are as a human being. Uh, as a, you know, whether you become a decent human being, but also for your creative identity. Because I think what happens oftentimes when you are successful is that you want to repeat yourself you kind of want to ah this thing was good let me do that again and then you become boring and 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 you lose courage and uh, so I think that that's probably much more dangerous that's uh, that makes a lot of sense and and of course I'm guessing that uh, as you become more successful that that people are offering you things that are similar to what you've done before Yes, yes. So that's something so that is that something you consciously try to avoid now. <laughs> so, you, the, so the trick is then to put yourself in a position where you are doing something that you have not done before, um, and then and then forgive yourself if you don't succeed. You know, I think there's I think there are honourable failures and dishonourable failures, and I think the honourable ones are the. I mean, we all make mistakes. The honorable ones are the ones where you thought something and you were wrong. Your, your artistic sort of uh, conceit was incorrect. It didn't work. And the dishonorable ones are the one where you are arrogant and sloppy and don't ask the questions in a deep and profound way. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, you, the 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 range and flexibility of your work it, it's it's really apparent that um constant asking questions do you feel is that something really fundamental to you completely totally that's fascinating can i ask you a question and i'm sure you get bored being asked this about the renaissance in in uh, copenhagen in denmark during the 90s during that period where you were starting off um was it did it did it feel like there were uh, there was a collegiality among the filmmakers that you were working with, or yes, is that something that only exists in retrospect? Definitely, definitely, definitely. I think you know, almost all of us came out of film school and the same film school, and and so there was a very common we, there was a very common experience behind all of us, and. Um, and I think there was also some sort of, of idea. I mean, you know, we, we've invited each other to each other's screenings and we were kind of trying to, you know, um, comment on each other, work, other's work and, and, and be helpful in that respect. And I, I want to say that I do feel that amongst directors that in general, that of course there are jealousy, of course there are other things as well. You know, we don't have to be stupid or naive, but I do, I do feel that in general that there is a, a the common thread is is respect and and there is a kind of um, a recognition of of people be of directors being different and interested and respectful in one another. I want to say that even in, in the American Film Academy, uh, um, which is, you know, America and Denmark are so different. Um, I want to say there is that sort of collegial um, respect and dignity. Do you, do you think that is, because uh, I, I love that and I love that about, it feels like it was so apparent in the, the culture that, that you created with your classmates in Denmark and that that appears to be present, you know, in the DGA and in the academy, this kind of um, collegiality. Do you think it's something that we can learn from across the rest of Europe? You know, yes, I mean, but I do think that within the 
within the like I know that like with I think like within UK directors uh, you know they have talks with other directors I do think it's there um I think what happens in general and I think that that's where we all might need to be better is that because we never work together yeah you know it's not like you have a costume designer whom you work with for years and 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 so there is you know you have a kind of you develop a friendship as well because we never work together it's it's it it often becomes difficult transcending the level of mutual respect and and politeness um and so i think it's you know i think it you know getting further than that is would take a firm decision of sorts I, I think that's really interesting. And, and I do love the fact what you say about going into other directors' cutting rooms and offering each other support. That sounds extraordinary uh, and, and exciting. I want to move on because you you've uh, you have such an extraordinary, extraordinary number of films to your name. And it's really interesting to hear you talk about, you know, some of them are successful. I mean, as far as I can see, they're all bloody successful. No, they're not. Um, but some of them, from your point of view, are more successful than others. And, and I'm, we're going to jump forward um, because it's you have so many films that that have become classics uh you know the one and only that i believe is still the most successful domestic film in denmark yeah. open hearts brothers i'm going to jump forward to the brilliant after the wedding in 2006 that feels like a a, a fulcrum or a turning point tell me if i'm wrong um and can i ask you how that story took shape <clears throat> you know it's funny it's it's, I really like the film. I mean, I like even my non-successful film, I still like, but um, I think After the Wedding was a, has a kind of interesting mix between being incredibly romantic and, and then it has a very kind of hard edge to it as well. Um, Well, why don't you ask me some questions? But I, I'll I, ask you some questions. So, to it was, <laughs> so you had developed a collaboration with Anders Thomas Jensen, which is obviously really fruitful. Mm -hmm. So can I ask you about where that story came from? Did he come to you with a script? Because obviously you guys work together very closely. No, no, no. I mean, whenever we do something, we kind of sit and play around with ideas. And then and then we kind of, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have storyline and then he starts writing and then we kind of go mm, it needs to go somewhere else i think i think i think where our our relationship is really fun and exciting is that there, it's a kind of there are no very definitive end goal and and we don't have we don't really care whose idea it is or whatever it is as long as it's good and then we, I mean, and also we kind of, we have a lot of fun and we also argue quite a lot, you know, um, and in a good way. There is, a, I think there is a very, uh, um, again, there's a huge amount of respect, but there's also a huge amount of kind of natural comfort between us. Meeting of minds. The, the one thing that really um, stands out for me as well with, with a lot of the work that you've done with Anders Thomas Janssen is um, it, the stories are incredibly swift moving. They're like after the wedding is really propulsive. Is, is, that, is that deliberate? Is that something that you think about or is it coming out of you? Look, I think of all the people I know, Anders Thomas Janssen is probably the most impatient person I know. And then, and then I'm probably number two. <laughs> So I think I think we have that sort of okay we get it let's move on or let's uh, um but I I mean we also like scenes that you know you know space between two human beings that are allowed to to stay in that space we like those scenes uh but but there need to be some kind of I mean I I've I've had um I watched too many movies that go on for ever and I just don't I'm sorry to say I know it's not the most popular thing to say in Europe but uh, I, I don't have patience for very very slow stuff I, I, you're allowed to name names we're among friends <laughs> but I, I think it's something that if I may and tell me if you think this is wrong 
that feels really specific to to your storytelling is that it's a really interesting blend of something that's you know for want of a better term really commercial that the stories move at such a pace and they're unexpected and they're exciting and they're thrilling um and at the same time as you say there's this depth of emotional analysis um that's obviously something that 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 you do very deliberately i think you pretty much defined me as a director right now uh um Yes, and I think that that has always been, you know, it has been my my luck and in certain aspects, my curse. I mean, I don't really care about that curse so much, but I, I want to say that for, for a number of years, I haven't been considered, you know, part of the, the, the how do you say, the finer society in Europe because... I've been too commercial. Oh, that's I'm, interesting. I mean, I'm clearly, I'm my storytelling is clearly, um, you know, I do want to have an audience. I do want to tell stories that audiences get and are, in, you know, intrigued by. And I'm not, I don't care for movies that don't have that. Yeah. And um, do you think that there's a snobbery attached to that in your Yes, life? I do. Do you? And I don't. I don't love snobbery in any shape or form. <laughs> a kind of anti-narrative snobbery, or how would you? How would you? No, I don't it? think so. I just think that, you know, I just don't. I just don't enjoy arrogance. I don't enjoy er- You know, being arrogant about how a general public will perceive. the way you tell your story and I don't enjoy I don't enjoy storytelling which has an intrinsic arrogance and which are not respectful of being understood that doesn't mean that I don't enjoy you know I do like you know I do fall in love with with very complicated and um, narrow stuff and, and get very excited about watching it but that's not the same as arrogance that's not, you know, you, you know, some artists can be incredibly sophisticated and, but that, that, that doesn't mean that they are arrogant, but I personally, my sort of the way I work is, is pretty commercial or broad or whatever. Communicative, would you put it in, the, in that yeah, sense? That, that, I, yeah, I feel yeah. like commercial is the wrong term, isn't it? It's yeah. communicative. It's, yeah. and yeah. That, that's what feels really powerful about it. And if I may, it, it feels like you walk this incredible tightrope where the story moves really fast, but the characters have real depth. They're, you know, it, it's it's an extraordinary skill. I still don't know how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, kind of you. And staying with them um, with uh, uh, after the wedding for for a moment, the as a, as an example of your work, those compelling performances. What we're talking about, the the story moves at pace but you carve out the time for such layered performances. May I ask you a little bit about how you work with actors, say for particularly with that film where we've got Mads Mikkelsen, who's obviously a, a frequent collaborator of yours and Sissi Babet Knudsen, an amazing cast. But they I mean, first of all, they are brilliant actors. So, so you start out at a very, very high level. Uh, and you start out with actors who just really want to cultivate every second. So it's real and it's it's um, fragile and it's intense and it's a whole lot of things at the same time. So you start out with actors who, who has a skill in the world to go there. And then I guess I've just always loved working with actors. I've always kind of uh, felt I... I had like an intuitive understanding of how actors work or how they think or what they feel. And and I think I also, I also, I'm always a little bit in love with my characters. Like I'm in love, like when I do a movie, I'm in love with all the characters. And and I kind of, um, and it irritates me a little bit. Like when an actor, if I meet an actor coming to set and they're wearing their own clothes, I'm kind of like, 
I feel they're being they're betraying me a little bit. You know, they should just be the character and and um, and and so so I think I have this um, like a little bit obsessive fascination with the characters, which which works well with them because they they know that I'm really looking at them. They know that I'm really um, with them. Yeah. So the, the casting process for you then sounds like it comes very much from here rather than from here. Is that fair? Yes. That doesn't mean that I switch off my mind, but it it um, it definitely is a. I kind of feel it. So you trust your instincts. Yes, but I do that generally. Right. I do. I do. I do. Whenever I have not done it, I've gone wrong. Ha! Huh, that's interesting. Can you give me an example of that? What what does that look like? When you don't do it, is it about being persuaded no, or about coming like, out of intellectually? It can be like a scene where I, you know, I kind of feel it should be in a certain way. And then for some reason, I let myself be persuaded by something else. And I have in the back of my mind, I have a, ooh, there's something that isn't quite working. And then I watch it and it's not working. So it's just, and, it's, it's not rational. It's something. No, but I, I, I mean, I'm also a pretty rational person. So I can usually, I can usually sort of verbalize why I think it is, but fundamentally it's an intuitive, instinctive reaction. But you can't, I mean, you know, you can't go, you can't tell an actor, you can't go. Yes, yeah, sometimes if you know them really well and you've done a lot of work together, you can just go, just do it because I think it's right. But that, that's at the end of the line. Uh, you have to build up a relationship uh, before that where you kind of go, you need to do this because, um, like, whatever, I'm just inventing an example. Sure. Like, um, uh, your husband has left you and you're on your own with um, three kids and um, and you're really mad, you're really upset, but now you have to make breakfast and you're all smiling with the kids. You're not going to show them. And so, 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 so what you want to do is that you then want to, you want to, you want to put the, and this is a very obvious example, but, but, you know, it might not have said in the script that the person should be smiling. It might have said, you know, the script might have said this person has been left. And then I intuitively feel that what you want to do is that you want to do, you want to create an inner conflict for, for the, for the actress in this case. And you want to, you want to make sure that everything she does is filled with some sort of tension because there are layers in it. That's lovely. That's lovely. That's And it's so apparent in the work. That's really interesting. So you're adding another spin. You're adding another layer to the characterization so that everything yeah. has more emotional depth. Yeah, I always do that. And, and, and it's not necessarily, you know, now I gave a very kind of a very polarized example. But I, but I, but I also, you know, if I, if I sit and look at people in a cafe, I do know what's going on. I understand what's going on, even if they, you know. So I've always had that in, insane interest in what's going on in relationship with other people. And it, let me ask you this. When you're working with actors at that level, do you, do you set aside a week in advance of filming? Do you rehearse? Do you sit yeah. down through the whole script? How do you do that? I do it on the day. You do it on the day? I don't. I don't really like, I feel that too much planning kills something. It becomes a bit stale. It's not that I, you know, it's not, I mean, you have to be very, very well prepared in order to be, to be free with your material. And that's how I usually work. Okay. Okay. So I you mean, wait until on the day. I mean, just so you know, so I spend about, like if I have to leave my house at 
let's say 5.30. I get up at 3.30. And, and I spend about an hour and a half looking at the scenes of the day and really kind of working them in my mind and really preparing for what kind of questions I'm going to get from the cast, what kind of um, issues there's going to be in terms of how to cover it. Not that I necessarily plan all the coverage, but, but I kind of, I'm insanely well prepared. And when I then come to set, I rehearse with the actors. And I do throw my pre-plan away. I kind of, you know, it's up, hey, let's, let's look at the scene. Let's see how we do it. Because maybe something better comes up. And I think part of the, part of the organic uh, nature of filming is embracing the moment and embracing whatever comes up, but be so well prepared that you can integrate it into the, to the bigger scheme of things. So that means, uh, as I've heard, that you're a big improviser on set. Look, I don't know. I don't. I'm not a big improviser because, quite frankly, I think most improvisations tend to get quite boring. Because once you, you know, at some at some point the at some point the cast are going to start arguing because they want to fuel the no, but they want to fuel the scene with energy. And they will run out of steam and they will start arguing. So I don't really love improvisations that much, but I do love making a written scene completely real. So, so we change it and we make it, but we don't totally, you know, yeah, I'm not, I also don't necessarily think that cast, you know, some actors are brilliant at improvising, but I also feel that some actors, some brilliant actors, are using the written word as a tool. And I don't want to take that tool away from them. Let's jump forward uh, because we could, the, there are so many brilliant films that we could pull, pull apart. I'd like to jump forward to Things We Lost in the Fire. Was that your first English language film, Susanna? Yes, it was. What was that like for you? I mean, that was, that was a real, cultural I mean that was very 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 different I mean you know when you're on set and you're working with the cast it's the same thing but everything about I mean that was like a proper Hollywood film and and it was just very different and particularly when it was done it was very different and I was not I don't want to I want to say that I was not quite familiar with how a you know how a movie was released and how to do it and 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 how to how to utilize the system. I, I wasn't aware of that. It was um, interesting. It was very, very educational. Did you feel like it was uh, of what I'm what I'm gleaning from what you're saying, tell me if I'm wrong, is that it was filmmaking at a more kind of industrial scale. So being on set is the same, but it's everything that's around the furniture that's all around that. Is that right? It was obviously much more um like it was just much bigger but it was also I want to say that you know cutting it but then kind of presenting into the studio and all of that I was completely unfamiliar with how the structures functioned and it was, was is it very different was it very different very, from it's very different it's very different I mean because I think in in Europe because we are a arts funded film industry, uh, the commercial pressures are completely different. And the way that they are treated is completely different. So it was, um, it was just really interesting and um, kind of, I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun, but more corporate. No, but I, I just think I think it's worthwhile mentioning because because as a European director, it does take a few films or a few whatever TV series or whatever until you actually understand how systems work and how you how you how you communicate with your agents, how you um, how 
you know, how the cast, how the office of a star works. Yeah. And that, it, that it's culturally very different. Very different, yes. That's really interesting. And I'm sure our audience would be fascinated to know more about that. But, but I think it's, um, it, it sounds like it's, it's about learning to use different levers, different yes. cultural levers. Would that yes. be fair? Yes, yes. Um, look, looking at that film, which is an amazing film and 100% a Susanna Beer film, which I think is um, an incredible achievement, given the fact that it was a huge cultural leap, clearly. Um, I'm, I was really struck by the fact that thematically it's really close to um, After the Wedding uh, and to Brothers. Is is that what drew you in? Is that the, the reason that you wanted to make it? Were you interested in exploring that thematic? You know, I, I'm going to be honest again. I think in a way that I thought, yeah, fun. Let me do an American film. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to pretend that I had all sorts of deep um, consideration. I'm not sure I did. Uh, well, I really respect that. And it's a brilliant film. <laughs> and it has so many of the of the um, the um, motifs that you're interested in, you know, the, the geochronology and the, the use of cinematography. That's so specific. Um, I, I'm, one of the things that I really enjoyed about that is uh, the there are some formal uh, moments in that film that are terrific. The moment where David Duchovny's character is killed is just masterful. It's so elegantly and beautifully articulated. And I wanted to ask you, jumping forward a little bit as well to things like Bird Box, do you storyboard? Is that something that you do or do you shoot and then uh, work it out when you get to the cut? I never storyboard. I don't, and, and, and whenever I have storyboarders, I've always strayed away from it. Of course, if you do... I mean, the one thing you have to storyboard, you have to storyboard stunts. Like in Bird Box, you have to storyboard things. Like once you kind of get into, you have a stunt person and you have all of these kind of things, you need to do that because, because you want to make sure that nobody gets endangered. You want to make sure that everything. And so, but for dramatic um, emotional thing, scenes, I don't storyboard. Let the actors have more freedom. Yes. I rehearse and then we set the shots and then we might then sort of um, then moderate the, the rehearsal so it works better for a specific, you know, the, the DP comes to the rehearsal and he would then kind of pull me aside and say, well, hey, why don't you we switch it around and we do this and we can then do that. Uh, um, but I always, I mean, my starting point is always the scenery between the characters. Taking that point, I'm going to jump forward again because I'm looking at the time and I want to ask you about In a Better World, which won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film 2010. It's an amazing, amazing film for anybody who hasn't seen it. Extraordinary film about loss and about masculinity and about violence. It's just brilliant. Um, the honesty of the performances that you got from those kids. Can you talk a little bit about that? Look, I've, I've worked with lots of kids in my, you know, and, and I have to say that, that talented kids are just as great actors as grown-ups. You know, they're less articulate and they might not know exactly why they don't think something is right or why they feel a certain way, but instinctively they do the right thing. And, and these boys were just massively talented. And... Um, and and kind of you know there there was a there was there was something incredibly endearing about them being being so young and still facing a very a kind of a very kind of sort of grown up crisis and um, and I I kind of want to say that it was probably one of the most personal things that Anna Thomas Jensen has written because I think a lot of those boy stories were, you know, I don't think that they were experienced, but they were certainly very personal to him and therefore very easy for me to work with. There's, a, there's such complexity. There's such moral complexity in that story. There's, you know, the... Well, those boys are, I mean, the, Anna Thomas Jensen wrote them with those complexities and with their, with their, with the, with the, with the kind of weird audacity 
and the shyness at the same time. Can I ask you something else, which is there's something about the way that you, because obviously there's a version of that story that could be very melodramatic. Um, and there's something about the way that you create those stories on screen. And I was trying to figure it out, watching all your movies going, is it about bringing us to a moment of anticipation and then jumping to a moment of aftermath? Is that, is no, that how you manage it? I, I tell you what it is because, you know, you know, reviewers of my films, and I want to say particularly Danish reviewers, have always been, have always had that sort of slight uh, disdain for the potential melodrama in everything that I've done. And, and I don't, I know why you say that, but, but here's the thing, I am pretty honest with everything I do. It's not, so, so even if there is a melodramatic, uh, you know, um, cause and effect, um, dramatic engine, all the moments are always very honest. And I am, I'm, I'm also a relatively honest person myself. And so I think it, I think that that's why you, you kind of wonder how that works. And I think that that's the reason. Okay. That it's about just trying to keep it completely authentic at, at yes. all times. Because yes. it, it, there's another, there's a moment like that in, in After the Wedding where a father meets his estranged daughter and they have a conversation about what she'd like to drink. And, and we see the glass a lot. And, uh, and, and, and in, interesting, the scene becomes about opening a, a bottle of mineral water, uh, which, which is very truthful. You know, it's kind of interesting in those big moments. You always think that those big moments are about, <gasps> and, that, and the melodramatic version of a big moment like that is that sort of great, playing out the great emotion. But the truthful version of a melodramatic moment or a dramatic moment is those details. It's, it's the fact that you keep opening and closing your shirt and not the grand gesture, which is rarely ever truthful. That's really interesting. So it's about finding something concrete and it's really it's cinematic. About finding it, it's about assessing it. Because once you start looking for it, it becomes untrue. Huh. And is that is that in the writing? Is that in the work you're doing with with the with the writer? No, it's in the moment, it's in the moment with the actors. Yes, <laughs> I know. I'm talking about. I know that I'm talking a, a little bit about something intangible, and and but 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 I really believe that that's the way it is. It's very human, right? It's it's trusting your own humanity in that moment. It's trusting your instinct, and it's trusting the the. It's, it's being incredibly um, open or aware as to what is truthful in any given moment. Like you order a cup of coffee and you don't, and you, you hold the coffee because it's nice and warm, but you are actually not really in a mood to drink it. It's, it's the, is that kind of thing of, of the, of the ambivalence in our behavior, which is very truthful. I'm going to hold on to that idea and bring it into concretizing that on film, because that's Morten Zerberg. Is that right? Is that the sure. guy? Morten Zerberg. Yes. Yeah. Say it again. Zerberg. <laughs> is that Danish letter? O -E. I know. I know the one. <laughs> so. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with him? Because that was clearly a very successful collaboration as well. It was a wonderful collaboration. Well, he's he came from documentaries. So he came from he came from being a visual storyteller himself, being a DP on documentaries, you're a visual storyteller. And um, and he brought that onto our fiction. And so he would, and he's like a weird like he's like a kind of physical wizard like the actors would move and he would he would know he's almost like a ballet dancer he would know before they made a move he would know where they were going and so he's just an amazing dp and then he had a a, 
back issue and he's he's much better now but uh, uh so then then at some point it was just a uh, like it's very hard sure. working with TP. so um yeah um, so at that point he 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 very graciously said, said no to to my next film because it was like that must have been very painful it was <laughs> yeah um, so talk to me about your fascination with dual storylines and dual chronologies that come up so often in your films. What is it that you love about that? I feel like one of the great things that movie making can do and is that you can, you can infuse one storyline with something, with, with, with a kind of subconscious story because you 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 start up a different storyline and they kind of feed of each other even if they're not necessarily part of each other they do inform each other in a different manner than each of them would have done on its own and i find that completely fascinating it's it's very interesting your your editing process creates great narrative tension when you when you do that, is that is that something that that uh, that becomes easier over time as you've made multiple films that that have that structure? Because it's quite a complex thing to do, I think, right? Well, the, you know, movie making. I mean, experience does make things easier, or I want to say, in a way, more joy enjoyable because you kind of you know stuff. And I mean, I used to, in the beginning of my career, I used to kind of wake up every morning, kind of going, how am I gonna, how am I gonna do today work? I mean, you know, I, I used to wake up with, with such anxiety about, whoa, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna be able to finish today's scene. And I don't anymore have that kind of anxiety. I, I, I work up with a, being very aware of the challenges and taking it very seriously, but it's more joyful. There's a level of confidence that comes with experience. Just yes. saying to every young director out there, Susanna Bear was once nervous about going on set. <laughs> Take that with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to jump forward again, if I may, because uh, I, I see we're running out of time. And recently you've made the move into television that began with uh, The Night Manager, which won such a slew of awards. I can't even name all of them, including an Emmy for you personally, as well as many Emmys for the show. What made you decide to move into television? Look, there's no doubt that the last 10 years, if you look at television, it has been, if not more exciting, then at least as exciting as the best movies around. And... Um, and and I was curious about that. And I want to say that, you know, after I did Nine Manager, I kind of got very excited about the long format. I got very excited about, hey, I now got six hours to tell a movie in as opposed to two hours. Wow, that's interesting. And, and, it's, and it, it has before. the qualities of your work. It's very swift moving with so many narrative turns and yet the characterization feels really rich. Well, now I've done 10 hours. I'm, I'm in the middle of finishing 10 hours. And how do you do that? How do you, how do you film 10 hours of drama as well, one director? I mean, I, mean, I mean, this is literally, I've done three long feature films, each, each being about three hours. So it's, it's, a, it's a show called First Lady. And, and there, there is no script for how to intercut those three massive um, feature films into 10 episodes but that's what I'm doing so I'm, I'm now literally cutting 10 hours of fiction with no script kind of messing it up <laughs> okay so for a woman who likes dual chronologies this is not a problem clearly <laughs> I want to say trial chronology so actually that because we're also cutting back in the past so there's a so, lot of storylines. So each each episode has has three uh, chronological times. Wow, wow. Even more. Some of them have more, but they but they also have three three completely unrelated stories. 
So one is Michelle Obama, one is Eleanor Roosevelt, and one is Betty Ford. Wow. And, and they are, you know, we're spending 120 years and we are kind of cutting them up between. <laughs> and are you uniting them thematically a little bit like you do in your feature films? Where, uh... Yes, I, I am. I, it's not. Yes, I am. But it's, you know, the fact that there is no script which has blended the story has made it quite interesting. Yeah, that's uh, that's a high wire act. <laughs> it's, it sounds like pure cinema, actually, as well, in that it, there's no script. You're working with the stories that you've made. How, how many shooting weeks is that? Ten hours of drama. Oh, it's a lot. It's a, it's about eight months. Like it, it was hundred and forty days. Wow! Wow! Just too much. You don't want to. You don't want to be on set for hundred and forty days. I, I'm I'm astounded that you're still able to speak after shooting consecutively 140 days. That's amazing. I, I can't wait to see it. And I've heard fantastic things about it. And uh, and I know the cast is extraordinary. Um, we've got five more minutes, so I'm going to run through uh, oh, sorry, so sorry. many more of your amazing pieces of work. Um, so after doing uh, uh, the spy thriller, um, the one of the uh, one of the other uh, projects that you made in the subsequent years was working with um, Netflix in one of their first forays into feature film, as I understand it, which was a massive success. Uh, Bird Box, which is also a, a sci-fi movie, um, and and of course a two a two chronological track movie because uh, clearly you uh, you can't do an easier film than having two stories going simultaneously. <laughs> Where, was there a difference for you when you jumped into uh, a sci-fi world or how was that for you? Yeah, I mean, it was, it, it was kind of, um, it was like a sort of semi-horror movie and um, it was really interesting and quite daunting in a way because you kind of had that whole genre thing and then you also, it's a, but it's essentially a story about motherhood. And I think the reason why Sandra Bullock wanted to do it was because of that and that was also the reason why I wanted to do it so there was a a proper substantial emotional substance to it that but and I think that that's why it became so hugely successful was that it because it was scary and it was kind of like a you know uh, we had audiences being terrified watching it but they were also very very emotionally engaged and it was interesting because, because we didn't, you know, it tested really well, but everybody wasn't, you know, everybody was a bit, you know, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? And then it opened and it just got massive, massive in no time. And, and Sandra, Bula and I, we were like testing, texting to one another, kind of going, this is crazy. Like Twitter went insane. This I remember is, it. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was huge. The, there's three, it strikes me, there's three really radical elements to that story. First of all, you've got Sandra Bullock playing somebody who, you know, uh, in in um, in executive speak, she's not really very likable. <laughs> and she's very authentic. And in, in, uh, Susanna Beer, authentic, absolutely three-dimensional, layered character way. She's not traditionally very empathetic or warm the way female characters are expected to be. She has a younger lover and he's black. Did you, was there, because you, you mentioned that you did some testing with that. Was there any response to those issues in the testing? I think both Sandra and I felt that, you know, maybe it was about time that, you know, we didn't really question and we didn't really want to discuss that. We thought that that was the right version of, um, that was a very suitable boyfriend for her. And, um, <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> but also you have a you kind of have a question you have almost like have have a story about a woman who almost sort of sort of um, can't deal with the fact that she's going to become a mother and 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 then she suddenly has two kids and um and and she turns out to be a brilliant mother, even if she doesn't fit into the traditional role of it. And, and I found that very satisfying. And I did also find it satisfying to, to for once, reverse the Hollywood gender policy. 
there's a there's a there's a feminist radicalism in that film that I that I'm excited about the fact that it goes unnoticed. And I'm I'm presuming that was deliberate on your part. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well done. <laughs> And I, am so says- up, I am so fed up. You know, I've got so many scripts. I get so, I, and not so much anymore, luckily, but I've got a number of scripts. And then you have like a, 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 a couple who are supposed to be the same age in the script. And then you have a conversation with the studio executive and all the, all the actresses you name for the female part, they go, no, 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 she's too old because she's actually the same age as opposed to being 20 years younger. And, uh, and I've just had, you know, I just got so fed up with it. Which brings us neatly onto the undoing with two actors who are the same age playing yeah. husband and wife. <laughs> and and it, that's that's interesting in that it, it pulls you into that thriller genre. Um, was it, was that a conscious choice that you made? Was that something yes, that you that really wanted to I, do? Uh, yeah, I, I felt that it needed to be a, a thriller. And on, on my first conversation with David Kelly, I felt that the, you know, the story could either be a drama or a thriller, but I did feel that the actually the undercurrent of drama would work best as a thriller. But also, I mean, essentially it's a story about who you can trust and who you can't trust, and can you trust yourself, which I find very truthful and interesting. Willful blindness and it's fascinating and, and comes up. In a lot of your earlier work as well, I think, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It's always been a kind of a theme in a lot of a lot of things I've done. Yeah, so that it felt very natural. What was it like working with them? Um, I mean, Nicole Kidman's obviously one of the premier actors of her generation, uh, and and also a huge star. Um, h- how is that? I'm not I'm not asking you to to talk about working with Nicole Kidman, but working with actors of that caliber who have massive international brands. Um, does that, is that a different experience from, uh, from say, working um, at a smaller scale? Essentially, it's the same. And, and essentially, you want the same from them in when, you, when you work. But of course, everything around them is different. And, and you've got to... You know, you you have to kind of understand how the system works a little bit in terms of of also being respectful of of how they work and how you know you know big stars are also incredibly exposed and are also you know trying desperately to be to stay to be human beings as well and 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 maintain a life. And, 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 and you, as a director, you need to understand the, you need to understand the trickiness of their life, as well as understanding how, how to work with them while being on set. Can I say that's really beautifully articulated and so generous. Uh, <laughs> and I really understand how you would be so the right director for somebody who is at that stage of their lives where they are at maximum exposure. And I can only imagine that's why the results have been so phenomenal. I'm aware we're two minutes over. I'm getting messages from Aideen going, why are you still talking? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Susanna, it's been such a privilege and a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you so much for sharing your experience and your insight and your creativity with me and with our audience today. Thank you. And you've been so kind and generous. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.